so yeah, again, so therapy really is a special kind of relationship. Uh, it provides a kind of zone of safety. Again, the notion of this kind of bubble, it, it gives you a place where there's this other person who's really trying to help you. It's kind of that medical model too. You see them as a doctor, a helper, um, and, and they don't have that kind of normal uh, social dynamics that you have to always worry about in dealing with other people because they're specifically there to help you. Uh, and you know they're trained to be uh, able to deal with your situation. They have expertise, they have knowledge, they're reassuring. Um, and, and that environment produces this really therapeutic, you know, literally uh, kind of uh, relationship where you're able to uh, rebuild and, and, you know, understand what's going on and then start, you know, in, the, in this safe environment, confronting the, the negative thoughts, the negative feelings, and, and then kind of processing those and then thinking about positive strategies for how you can overcome those issues. So it really is a, uh, you know, a person to person kind of amazing feature of uh, people, our social power, our social influences that we've talked about so much can be leveraged for good. Uh, and so that's one of the big interesting stories in psychology is actually seeing that these therapeutic approaches, uh, have, you know, long, long ridiculed and mocked as people kind of laying on the couch, etc. Um, you know, actually really scientifically are, uh, very, very valid and very effective. Uh, and, and there really is something to it. There's been some studies, uh, that show that this, uh, therapeutic approaches in particular, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is one that, that is very widely used and very well validated, uh, performs better than these, you know, uh, kind of uh, Prozac kind of serotonin specific reuptake inhibitor pills. These pills are often used for anxiety and depression. Again, these most common cases. And the nice thing is that therapy really doesn't have any of those negative side effects that the medications have. On the other hand, it is very expensive. So we need to find ways of making uh, this therapy more widely accessible uh, at, at lower cost. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, who who's involved in this process of, you know, treating people with uh, psychological disorders. And there's a, a range of different types of professionals that are involved in this whole sphere of things. And one kind of central, uh, you know, Bible, so to speak, of the field, uh, the DSM-5 uh, that kind of governs uh, the collective identification of, you know, what is a disorder uh, what are the different types of disorders and what are the, the kinds of ways that we might treat them? So uh, a psychiatrist is a MD. They have a medical degree. Um, and that means that they have like four years of additional intensive schooling after undergraduate. Uh, and that enables them to be able to prescribe drugs. They, uh, they go on and do, you know, residency and, and all this other kind of further levels of uh, a training and they get certified and all this other stuff. So that's kind of the, the, the most rigorous and kind of medical model kind of way of uh, uh, being someone who can treat uh, people with clinical dis with disorders. Um, you have a clinical psychologist who is a PhD or has a master's. Um, they get kind of state board level certified and they get trained in these specific forms of therapy. Uh, and they uh, also take, you know, a lot of basic science classes and know a lot about how people work. Um, and so that is your kind of frontline basic uh, form of clinical therapist is typically a clinical psychologist. Uh, a lot of uh, graduate programs around the country have clinical programs and they have this very rigorous accreditation process and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, but those people outside of a few specific cases in different states typically cannot uh, prescribe drugs. So that's a big difference between a psychiatrist and a clinical psychologist. Uh, then you have a social worker uh, who's typically somebody with a master's degree. They can also get training in the same kinds of therapy approaches and other kinds of therapy approaches. Typically don't have that kind of PhD level, kind of more uh, extensive uh, expertise and, and more of a research uh, perspective. And so they're more uh, hands-on kind of uh, person there. 
Um, and then you have a neurologist who is, again, an MD, like a psychiatrist, goes, has gone to medical school and then has gone on into uh, typically more uh, direct uh, medical and, you know, surgical type of intervention programs um, where they can directly treat things at, at a biological level. And so these are your typical people that work on kind of Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, epilepsy. Uh, and we'll talk in a moment about how there are these kinds of disorders that really have a very clear kind of uh, biological basis and can be treated directly through these kind of biological interventions. And therefore, kind of neurology tends to be the, the discipline that, that is most associated with that. And then uh, this DSM-5, again, is published by the American Psychiatric Society. So uh, psychiatrists are involved in that, as well as clinical psychologists. Um, and uh, this is essentially this, this kind of major uh, effort to uh, consolidate everything that we currently understand about these disorders and put them into one kind of, you know, central tome uh, that, that provides guidelines for everybody working uh, in this area. You know, the, the standard kind of medical model for other things that af affect different parts of our body, like heart disease or liver, et cetera, is, is, is very standard, right? You have some clear biological thing that's wrong, right? So your arteries are clogged in heart disease. You know, it's a physical thing that's happening. And then the treatment is directly kind of focused on fixing that, right? Uh, so, you know, again, if you have like, you know, an infection, you take antibiotics and it gets rid of the uh, bacteria, right? This works for certain diseases that have well understood uh, and treatable kinds of biological basis. So Parkinson's disease, for example, is, you know, a reduction in the amount of dopamine uh, in the basal ganglia. And this can be treated by drugs that basically replace that dopamine and other kinds of therapies targeted in that direction. Uh, epilepsy is overactivity in the brain. So there's just very clear kind of causes of uh, what these different diseases are and how to treat them. Uh, and the question is, you know, why, why don't we just have like a disease model for all aspects of psychological disorders? And again, this is where this kind of attractor model really helps us understand that there are certain things that really just are kind of more basic, kind of easier treated biological kinds of things that fit very well with this disease model. But a lot of things don't fit with this disease model and don't uh, have a direct, easily accessible biological cause. It's not a chemical imbalance in the brain, um, but rather it is actually this kind of emergent loss of cognitive control and overall feelings of self-efficacy, et cetera, and that that system needs to be rebooted, not necessarily from the biological side, but more from the inside, from the per perspective of the individual. Yeah, so basically we are active agents in our own brains. We're in control uh, and these disorders challenge our feelings of control. And this treatment process is really this process of trying to restore that feeling of self-efficacy and control. And that gives you back onto this virtuous cycle. And the kind of popular general understanding of these disorders is this kind of notion that, you know, look, if you're depressed or you're anxious, you know, that's kind of something that you could theoretically uh, manage on your own. And, and people have this kind of, I think, outdated sense of like, you know, why don't you just tough up and, you know, deal with it kind of thing. Uh, and, and, and so if you don't, aren't able to deal with these disorders in that way, then there, there is this kind of sense of social stigma that, again, I think is more historical than current because of the prevalence of these disorders. We see that these things are very, very widespread and it is hard for people to deal with these things on their own. And so sometimes you need that help from other people, from the therapist, to help you kind of reboot your system and be able to deal with these situations. So these issues of, you know, understanding the true basis of these different uh, types of disorders uh, really does raise a lot of interesting questions about, you know, this kind of stigma and sense of who's to blame, et cetera. The real success story here is that there are effective treatments. We do understand what does treat these disorders and that by understanding this and applying these effective techniques, 
we can all uh, improve our uh, psychological function.